Did you know that Hugo Boss, the iconic fashion brand for luxury and style, has a shocking and controversial history that's largely unknown to many? It boasts over 15,000 employees and a commendable revenue of $4.23 billion as of November 2023. But behind these numbers lies a story that's a mix of triumphs, ethical debates, and unexpected revelations. In this video, we will discover this fashion icon shocking yet mind-boggling story. So stay tuned and let's get right in. Hugo Boss AG, often styled as Boss, is a renowned fashion house and brand headquartered in Metzingen, Baden-Württemberg, Germany. The company has established itself as a leading player in the global fashion industry, offering a diverse range of products, including clothing, accessories, footwear, and fragrances. With its impeccable craftsmanship, stylish designs, and commitment to quality, Hugo Boss has garnered a loyal following worldwide and is one of Germany's largest clothing companies. Let's learn about its history to know how it became what it is today. In 1923, Hugo Boss ventured into the clothing business, setting up his own company in Mitzingen, Germany, which still stands today. Alongside two partners, he established a factory in 1924, producing a range of clothing like shirts, jackets, workwear, sportswear, and raincoats. However, the economic conditions in Germany at the time weren't favorable. This financial strain forced Hugo Boss's company into bankruptcy. In 1931, after reaching an agreement with his creditors, he was left with just six sewing machines to rebuild his business. During the early 1930s, Hugo Boss made a notable turn by joining the Nazi party. He obtained membership and actively engaged with various Nazi-affiliated organizations, such as the Stuhstaffel, the German Labor Front, and the Reich Air Protection Association, among others. His association with these groups resulted in a considerable surge in sales, escalating from 38,260 Reichsmarks in 1932 to over 3,300,000 Reichsmarks by 1941. It's worth noting that while Boss claimed to have supplied uniforms to the National Socialists since 1924, evidence suggests that it likely started in 1928 or later. By 1932, the Hugo Boss Company was producing all-black SS uniforms, contributing to outfits for the SS and later expanding to design uniforms for the Wehrmacht and the Waffen-SS. During World War II, Hugo Boss's company employed approximately 140 forced laborers, predominantly women, along with 40 French prisoners of war for a brief period. Historical accounts describe Boss and his managers as ardent Nazis who admired Adolf Hitler, even hanging a photograph of himself with Hitler displayed in his apartment. After the war, Hugo Boss faced consequences for his affiliations and support of the Nazi party. He was initially classified as an activist and a supporter and beneficiary of National Socialism. However, upon appeal, he was eventually categorized as a follower, a lesser designation that did not label him as an active promoter of National Socialism. Hugo Boss passed away in 1948, but his business continued. During the post-war era, Hugo Boss, the man behind the brand, wasn't allowed to continue his fashion business. His son-in-law, Eugen Holly, took the reins. In the 1950s, after a stint making work uniforms, the company snagged its first men's suit order, kickstarting a major expansion that led to a bustling team of 150 by the year's end. Fast forward to the swinging 60s, and Boss was in the business of ready-made suits hitting its stride. Eugen stepped aside in 1969, leaving the company in the capable hands of his son, Joachim and Uwe, who set their sights on global reach. The 70s marked a pivotal moment, the birth of the iconic Boss branded suits, sealing the brand's identity as a major player in the fashion arena. But that wasn't all. 
they revved things up with motorsports, backing legends like Nicky Lauda and the McLaren racing team, making a mark on the racing scene. Then, in 1984, Boss leaped into fragrances, unlocking growth that propelled them to the Frankfurt Stock Exchange by the next year. Sports got a Boss makeover, too, diving into golf with the Bernhard Langer and tennis through the Davis Cup by 1987. But the 80s were only the beginning. The 90s brought another level of expansion and innovation. After a big stake sale to the Marzotto Textile Group in 91, the company introduced the Hugo and Baldessarini brands in 1993. Then came the footwear range in 1995, expanding to a full line of leather products across all their sub-brands. Adding to their repertoire, Boss joined hands with the Solomon R. Guggenheim Foundation, birthing the Hugo Boss Prize in 1996. This annual art stipend set the company on a philanthropic path in the modern art scene. In 2005, the fashion brands under Marzotto shifted gears to the Valentino Fashion Group, later snagged by the Permira Private Equity Group. Fast forward to 2015, when Permira decided to sell off its remaining 12% stake, releasing 91% of shares on the Borsa Frankfurt, while the company held on to a tiny 2%. Meanwhile, about 7% of the shares returned to the Marzotto family. Hugo Boss didn't just stop at making waves in the fashion world, they were doing the rounds, racing at least 6,102 points of sale across a staggering 124 countries. Their impressive direct ownership spanned over 364 shops, with an additional 537 monobrand shops and 1,000 plus franchisee-owned outlets. By 2009, the Boss Hugo Boss segment was the heavyweight champion gobbling up 68% of sales. The rest of the pie consisted of Boss Orange at 17%, Boss Selection at 3%, Boss Green at 3%, and Hugo at 9%. The numbers in 2010 were nothing to sneeze at either. $2.3 billion in sales and a sweet net profit of $262 million. That meant royalties chipped in 42% of the total net profit. Then. Turning the pages to June 2013, the fashion world cheered as Jason Wu stepped into the spotlight as the artistic director of Boss Women's Wear, adding a dash of creativity to an already illustrious brand. As the clock ticked into 2017, Hugo Boss got the champagne ready because their sales soared a remarkable 7% during the last quarter. The numbers were a testament to their enduring legacy marking the brand's unwavering success story in the ever-evolving world of fashion and retail. Hugo Boss was not just a brand, but a global phenomenon. Hugo Boss stands tall on its two strong pillars, Boss and Hugo, the core brands defining its fashion identity. Behind the scenes, products are crafted across multiple hubs, with manufacturing taking place in the company's own production sites in Germany, Italy, Poland, Turkey, and even the United States, a testament to their global reach and commitment to quality. The brand has invested in cutting-edge technology, elevating its made-to-measure program to new heights. Here, machines take the reins, handling most tailoring tasks traditionally reserved for skilled human hands. This technological leap underscores Hugo Boss's dedication to innovation and precision in fashion. Moreover, Hugo Boss's impact transcends the realm of clothing. They've inked licensing agreements with various esteemed companies, unleashing a diverse range of Hugo Boss branded products. From teaming up with tech giants Samsung, HTC, and Yahweh for sleek mobile phones, to collaborating with Nike for sports gear and Cotty for fragrances and skincare, Hugo Boss has left its stylish footprint in various realms. Not content with resting on its laurels, the brand made a fashion statement in 2020 by introducing its inaugural vegan men's suit. 
The suit embraced a cruelty-free ethos, using only non-animal materials, dyes, and chemicals. It showcased Hugo Boss's commitment to sustainability and ethical practices, marking a significant stride in the fashion industry's evolution towards eco-consciousness. Hugo Boss, a well-known clothing manufacturer, has had its fair share of scandals hovering over it. Russell Brand, a British comedian and actor, made headlines for his outrageous behavior at the 2013 GQ Awards, which Hugo Boss sponsored by revealing the company's ties to the Nazi party. Brand mimicked a goose stride and made a mocking reference to Hugo Boss's service in World War II when accepting an award. The brand was quickly removed from the ceremony due to his unconventional behavior, and he later apologized for his humorously off-the-wall commentary. However, the fashion giant's brush with controversy doesn't end there. When the firm announced in 2010 that it might close a factory in Brooklyn, Ohio, it received criticism from actor Danny Glover. Workers had previously voted down a proposal to decrease their hourly salaries by 36%, leading to this decision. Despite initial opposition, Hugo Boss planned to relocate its suit production operations to other global sites. The corporation caved into the pressure and the boycott in the end. Another black mark on Hugo Boss's record was the Mirror Fall incident in 2015. A toddler died at one of its stores in Beechester, Oxfordshire, leading to a 1.2 million pound penalty. A heavy steel-framed mirror in the dressing room toppled over, killing the four-year-old four days later due to the horrific injuries he suffered. The court concluded that the mirror had been negligently left unsecured. The firm has apologized for breaking safety rules and promised to make changes to avoid similar incidents in the future. Trademark tussles have also snagged Hugo Boss. The fashion giant used its legal might to defend its brand against threats from smaller competitors like Boss Brewing and Boss Athletics Incorporated. This action, exemplified by the delivery of cease and desist letters, resulted in thousands of dollars of legal bills for the impacted firms and resulted in a name change. It also sparked public debate on the use of legal clout against similar entities. But the causes of controversies are sometimes more complex than at first glance. A firestorm of criticism was caused by Hugo Boss's decision to continue using cotton sourced from China's Xinjiang region. Hugo Boss's Chinese branch, which had previously distanced itself from Xinjiang cotton on worries about Uyghur forced labor, has now stated its usage of and support for the region's cotton, leading to great concern. There was a lot of pushback since the corporation changed its position, and many people accused it of being hypocritical. A subsequent statement maintained that the firm hadn't directly acquired goods from Xinjiang, but sourced components from sources complying with its ethical standards. In 2021, things got worse when a complaint was made against Hugo Boss by the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights which accused the company of aiding and profiting from forced labor in Xinjiang. Investigations in 2022 seemed to validate allegations, identifying Xinjiang cotton in Hugo Boss shirts. Hugo Boss's recent troubles highlight the complex difficulties global brands face in upholding ethical standards, resolving legal disputes, and meeting the expectations of their customers. The enormous stakes and unrelenting scrutiny of the fashion industry brought home to Hugo Boss by these instances. Hugo Boss, the German fashion bigwig, did some soul-searching and got an expensive makeover, splitting into Hugo and Boss. It's all about staying hip and catching the eye of those trendy youngsters. The idea is to rev up the brand, focus on different age groups, and do it in style. Boss remains the cornerstone, catering to the 25 to 40-year-old crew, all while getting a facelift with a new logo and whatnot. Then there's Hugo, looking to win the hearts of the Gen Z gang with its more sporty vibe. CEO Daniel Greider called it a fresh new era for the brand that's been around since 1924. 
Now, zooming into the local scene, Who's Who.mt snooped around about what's cooking for the St. Julian's store. Word has it the changes are in the air. The store is expected to get a new look soon, matching the rebrand vibe. And guess what? Valletta's Jean de Valette Square might see a new player in town. There's a sign teasing the arrival of a brand new store, putting all the focus on the Hugo vibe. The OG Hugo boss has come a long way since its humble beginnings in the 1920s. Now, it's a heavyweight luxury brand, 15,000 people worldwide hustling to make everything look perfect. From the classiest gowns and suits to everyday casuals, gym wear, shades, and accessories, their motive is to look and feel good no matter what the scene is. These guys are everywhere. With stores in 124 countries, they've got their fingers in fashion and art events, making their presence felt in every chic corner of the globe. Speaking of smelling good, Hugo Boss knows a thing or two about fragrances. They entered the scent game in 1985 with Boss No. 1, a cologne for the gents. From there, it's been a fragrant journey, cooking up different men's colognes like Boss Elements and Hugo for men. By 97, they had something for the ladies too, Hugo for women. Fast forward, and now they've got a bouquet of nearly a hundred Hugo Boss fragrances ready to suit every mood and occasion. Whether it's classy, sassy, or chill vibes you're after, they've got your scent game covered. So, Hugo Boss is making moves, keeping it fresh and diverse, aiming to cater to every age group's fashion fantasies. Whether it's a suit or a laid-back look, a fragrance for a date night or a power meeting, Hugo Boss wants to be the go-to for making you look your absolute best. Did their story inspire you? What have you learned from it? Do let us know in the comments section below, and don't forget to subscribe. See you in the next video.